All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, we're uh, pleased to have today Dr. Amna Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is, uh, many of us know Dr. Ahmed, you know, in her role through EPIC, you know, but uh, for us general terms, we know her most. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is a, a general internal medicine physician at Hamilton Health Sciences based at the Jervinsky Hospital and she's an assistant professor at McMaster University. Uh, she completed her master's in health quality from Queens University, and uh, she is uh, one of the associate chief medical information officers uh, for EPIC implementation at, at Judge has been working so hard over the last year plus to uh, get us where we are today. So thank you, uh, Amna. She's also the co-chair uh, of the McMaster Quality Improvement and Patient Safety uh, Community of Practice, uh, Probably many of the audience are members of that uh, community of practice. And uh, she is involved in uh, quality improvement and patient safety curriculum development for both residents and faculty, and is the chair of quality improvement curriculum for the GIM uh, subspecialty program. I call Amna is the quality person in GIM. So uh, thank you, Amna, for uh, presenting today. And no surprise, uh, Amna is going to talk to us about uh, quality improvement in your practice. Very exciting, very important uh, topic for us in GIM and uh, across the Department of Medicine for both uh, the hospital and the university. So without uh, further ado, uh, Amna, please uh, take it from here. Thanks so much, Rukhal, for that kind introduction. And thank you everyone for uh, coming to the rounds. I thought I'd do a presentation on quality improvement and how you can incorporate that into your practice. But to start off with, I just want to do a land acknowledgement so McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nation and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We are privileged to provide care on lands that Indigenous peoples have called home for thousands of years. We recognize and respect the presence and stewardship of all Indigenous peoples as keepers of this land. So today I'll discuss some of the fundamental principles of quality improvement. I'll talk a bit about how to use quality improvement methods and tools in your practice improvement, how to incorporate quality improvement into continuing professional developments, and discuss a framework for resident quality improvement curriculum. And if you want so to, is, sorry to interrupt, but if you want to put yourself on the uh, uh, presenter view and move the slides because they're not moving. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I do have them on presenter view on mine. Um, I don't know why so the slides are not moving. Okay, let me try something else here, two seconds. Sorry to interrupt your Just stop sharing and try that one more time. Are you seeing the presenter slides now? Yep, that's perfect and it's moving. Perfect. Fantastic. Great. Okay. Thank so you. I'll just display the objective slide again and then uh, talk about what is quality improvement. So. When I think about what is quality improvement, there's many ways of thinking about quality improvement. You can think of it more from a pragmatic point of view or from a philosophical point of view. So quality improvement really at a broad level is a problem solving framework to improve a process or outcome. And our application of quality improvement in our healthcare system really has been adapted from other industries such as the automotive industry or aerospace industry. From sort of a physician point of view or provider point of view, quality improvement may just be simply about making care better. Um, it could be about evaluating your current state of your practice and asking yourself, is there room for improvement? It could be about trying a change idea and adjusting it or adopting it. And for me, I think the definition that sort of encompasses what quality improvement for me is thinking about adding value to every component of healthcare. There are six domains of healthcare quality that healthcare should be safe, it should be effective, it should be patient-centered, it should be timely, it should be efficient, and it should be equitable. And our healthcare system certainly has faced challenges in providing these domains of healthcare quality, but we know that the pandemic has really highlighted some of these challenges to the forefront. So why does quality improvement matter? especially when all of us already have so much on our plate. Because the reality is that our healthcare system is a very complex system. And we have ideas about how to make things better, but sometimes it's very challenging to implement those changes 
in such a complex system. So we need a framework of understanding where we are, how we apply our change ideas, and can those change ideas really lead to an improvement? And quality improvement is important because at the end of the day, no change idea can be implemented in isolation. It affects others. It is a multidisciplinary approach. So why does quality improvement matter? Um, and a few things I want everybody to sort of ponder on and ask yourself, are we really providing the best care possible? And even if we are, are all the components of the healthcare we provide adding value? Our patients come to our hospitals and clinics to get care and get better, but the reality is that there is harm from healthcare. You can look at simple things such as, you know, hospital acquired infections, catheter associated infections, um, hospital acquired COVID infections, medication errors. So the reality is that there is harm from healthcare. From more of a pragmatic and financial point of view, there are funding agreements for healthcare organizations that are linked to quality benchmarks. And as I alluded to earlier, the post-pandemic healthcare challenges have been really brought to the forefront because of COVID, but it also gives us a lot of opportunity for innovation and thinking, how do we want to do things differently? I think quality improvement is also important because there's a need for a quality improvement patient safety culture. And I think lastly, which sort of alludes to sort of my academic hat and thinking from an academic point of view is that we do have a shortage of faculty who have sufficient quality improvement patient safety expertise to support student and resident learning. And quality improvement at the end of the day is becoming more and more important, not just sort of from an academic point of view, but from requirements by different provincial regulators. And it needs to be part of our continuous professional development as well. And over the years, there has been a shift in the approach from passive learning about quality improvement to active learning to engage physicians in processes of quality improvement. So provincial regulators are phasing out that random peer audits and moving to physicians engaging in quality improvement in their own practice. So for instance, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario has a new program where physician contribution to hospital QI can count towards CPSO requirements or even within individual practices. The CPSO Quality Improvement Program, which is sort of like a pilot program right now, uses about 20 it looks at 20 eligible physicians that are randomly selected, and it's a five-year cycle, and they can be involved in the program either as individuals or groups. The Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, as you might have seen, is also putting out additional resources and recommendations about learning quality improvement as part of CPD, and all of us can claim Section 3 credits, and it's really Section 3 is about any process that's associated with changes in your practice and improvement in patient outcomes. So it can be a practice assessment with peer feedback or comparison to benchmarks. And I'll go into a few more details and examples of what else can be done for section three. And we can all claim three credits per hour. Or on the flip side, if you are someone who's a quality improvement coach or you are providing uh, peer feedback, you can also claim section two credits. And it's one and three for one year under section two. So what are some of the examples of Section 3 credits or that you can do for a CPD? So one of the ideas uh, could be implementing a Choosing Wisely Improvement Program. I think most of us are familiar with the Choosing Wisely uh, campaign. And on the Choosing Wisely website, you can pick sort of recommendation or ideas for improvement based on your specialty. It could be something simple as you want to reduce the number of blood transfusions, or you want to reduce the number of routine blood work that's ordered for inpatients, or any other idea that may be more relevant for your specialty. You can do reflective exercise for quality improvement initiatives, so a reflective exercise on practice changes due to COVID-19 that you have made. It could be about implementation of the EMR, so you could do a reflective exercise in how you have changed your clinical practice with the use of or implementation of EPIC. So to give you an example, I at the start found but a little bit challenging to figure out what's the most efficient workflow for me with EPIC when I'm doing inpatient rounding. So I did a trial and error of, okay, when do I want to do my notes? When do I want to look at lab results? What device do I want to use while I'm physically on the rounds? Do I want to use Haiku or not? Is that helpful? 
or trying a few things such as reminders to follow up on tests. So I did a bit of trial and error with using the follow-up reminder list or creating a remind you within your basket. And you can do a reflective exercise for that and claim section two credits. Or if it is part of your specialty or part of your usual uh, processes, if you do an annual performance review with feedback, that could certainly be used. Or you could do your own chart audit and feedback. So you could do a chart audit of if you have a diabetes clinic, how many of your patients were referred for an eye exam or how many patients were reminded for an eye exam. It could be a direct observation feedback from a peer. So one of my colleagues can come and observe me giving sort of discharge instructions to a patient or doing communications around the transition of care and get feedback on that. And that certainly can be used. Or you could be get reviewing on, sorry, review of feedback on teaching. It doesn't have to be about clinical practice. Or you can do practice self-assessment and feedback without necessarily uh, you know, sort of having a direct observation if that was not feasible within your practice. The Royal College website has examples and worksheets and tools for all of these examples. Um, so I encourage everyone to look at that. And it is quite uh, sort of uh, self-explanatory and a lot of tools are available. So if you haven't done that, there's a lot of help available there as well. So as I alluded to, provincial regulations, CPD requirements are moving more towards quality improvement. We know why quality improvement is important. But I think we also have to reflect on if all of this is happening, why is it that everyone is not involved in quality improvement? What are some of the barriers? I think one could simply be a lack of interest or lack of familiarity or lack of buy-in in terms of why quality improvement is important. Personally, I think one of the most important barriers is not having dedicated time to work on quality improvement in our practices. There needs to be important incentives for physicians that are already quite busy in order to be involved in QI. Proficiency in QI methodology is an important barrier. All of us like to do well in everything that we do. So if you're not proficient in something, it's challenging to get started on that. There's a lack of benchmark data and in general, lack of quality improvement metric data or evidence to compare those measures with. Those are slowly improving as more and more hospitals and specialties are doing quality improvement and starting to do more larger level data labs, but it's still a work in progress. And quality improvement and multidisciplinary, it's hard for a physician to just simply start a project completely on their own. There may be certain settings in your own practice where you may be able to do a project that's just about your workflow, such as the one I was talking about, about how to use Epic. But often quality improvement projects and improvement processes are a multidisciplinary approach. So it does mean having to get stakeholder buy-in, having a team that's on board, and uh, that takes time and effort. And I think the last important barrier is that QI is still often done as a parallel process apart from work. So there's your clinical work, and then you do quality improvement on the side, very much like that dichotomy of sometimes clinical work and research. So I think physicians need training and support to do quality improvement in their practice and quality improvement activities need to be embedded in our clinical work in order for us to overcome some of these barriers. So how do you get started? So as I mentioned, we have a very complex healthcare system, but I think what's important to recognize is that quality improvement plans need to be simple and actionable. And this is something I personally struggled with at the start when I got involved in quality improvement. There's this tendency of understanding everything that's wrong and wanting to just overhaul everything and starting at a big level rather than thinking, okay, where do I start? So I think in terms of where to start, we can ask ourselves, well, what is the next step to improve? There's many challenges and I'm not gonna fix this in one day, but where can I start? And it needs to be actionable. So what can I do by next Thursday? So some of the examples that I wanted to share of quality improvement activities for CPD, um, this is sort of from a hospital-based specialist. So you could do review data requested from hospital decision support to identify improvement opportunities, attending morbidity and mortality rounds, and participating in a patient safety incident review, reviewing performance reports that compare institutional patient outcomes to those of other hospitals. This may be available in some specialties and may not be available in others. So an example is the Gemini project or the GemQuin network. 
Now we're able to compare some of our general internal medicine data to other uh, institutions. You can reflect on results of a patient experience, report from a hospital unit or a clinic if that's set up for you, or contributing to an institutional QI initiative as a member of the multidisciplinary team, or attending a CPD program focused on QI methods. And I'll give, an exa give a few examples of those programs later on in the presentation. If your practice is mainly ambulatory, and I think this applies to family physicians as well as other medicine subspecialists that may have mainly ambulatory practices. Again, you can do an audit chart on a topic of interest and reflect on opportunities to improve. And this can be done either individually or with colleagues. You can complete an online self-assessment tool and both the Royal College website has a few tools you can use as well as UBC has an e-coach tool that you can use. You can reflect on EMR generated practice reports that compare quality of care outcomes of the clinic with those of other clinics. And there are tools now within Epic that allow us to generate some of our that, that data ourselves without having to go to someone else. You can review the results of patient surveys again, and again, similar uh, tools as I mentioned. I'll briefly go over some quality improvement and patient safety tools. And some of this may be too basic for some, and for others, they'll need to dig a little bit deeper. It's hard to teach everything about quality improvement and short grounds, but I at least wanted to highlight some of the high yield tools that are important. So sort of the basics is really the model of improvement and PDSA cycle. And the model of improvement has three components. What is your aim? How are you going to measure it? And what is your change idea? So your aim really is what are you trying to accomplish? Your measure is how will we know that a change is an improvement? And your change really is what changes can we make that will result in an improvement. And the goal is really to just do PDSA cycles. So you plan your uh, model for improvement, what you want to achieve, how you're going to measure it, what the change will be. You try to implement it, and then you study and analyze how that change went. And often we run into barriers. We realize that things didn't actually go as smoothly as we wanted, or a change idea is not going to have the impact that we thought it would. And then you act and adapt and essentially go through iterative cycles of PDSA. Others in quality improvement prefer sort of a slightly different uh, framework. And one of the other frameworks is the DEMIAC, the Six Sigma DEMIAC improvement process. And based on the wording, you'll also see that this has been adapted from other industries as well. So first you're really trying to define the project goal and your deliverables. What are you trying to achieve? Define the problem. Then you measure the processes to determine where you are currently and try to quantify the problem. Then you analyze and determine the actual root causes of your problem. Then improve the process by eliminating and addressing some of those root causes. And then control, which is trying to sort of control the future process performance and making sure that your improvement doesn't degrade over time and develop sustainability. Another tool that I really liked, and this is again also on the Royal College website, is the model from adapted from the Ottawa Hospital, which sort of combines both the PDSA cycles as well as the DEMI model. And when you go to the Royal College website, you can actually work through this as a clickable guide. So again, you do the planning and project management, define the problem, analyze the situation, test and trial different improvements with iterative PDSA cycles, lock in your improvement based on what works, and then you evaluate and spread to other units or other areas, or think about how you make it more sustainable. So in this stage of when you're trying to define a problem, what are some of the tools that you could use to define your problem? So if you are working either individually or especially in a team, you can use a project charter and you can find project charters and examples of them online through Ontario Health, IHI, or even just Googling it, you should be able to see a project charter. And a project charter is really to outline who your team is, what your aim is, what your measures are, who your stakeholders are, what, are your, what is your budget, and what are your timelines. So it helps you kind of define the problem and outline, sort of like creating a research proposal. You can use the five W's or two H's. And again, this is sort of synonymous to you know, your PICO research question. So what, why, where, who, when, and how is your project going to be, and by how much are you trying to improve? If you're trying to understand 
the current problem, you can use process mapping and I'll show you an example of that to understand the current state of your clinical workflow or your current problem. You really, in the defining the problem stage, you want to have an aim statement. And that's really about what are you trying to accomplish by how much and by when. So an example could be, you know, our team would like to reduce catheter associated UTIs in hospital on medicine ward E3 by 30%. Um, in six months. This is an example of a process map and process maps sort of help you understand the various steps. And you can either process map sequentially based on the first step and the second and the third, or you can think of it as high level process map where you think about the high level processes that are happening and then break the further processes down. The reason why this is important, and depending on your project, it may be important to understand the role of everyone. And it also helps you highlight where some of the waste may be or unnecessary steps or where in the process you need to intervene on. And it also helps you recognize who are all the stakeholders that will be involved. So this is an example of a patient getting registered from BD all the way to seeing the ER position. So if you wanted to intervene or improve, you know, um, time to the cath lab, and that was your goal, this may be one of the processes that you want to look at. Or if the goal was to reduce wait times from ED registration to ER position, you may want to understand the various uh, steps and processes that happen. So once you've defined the problem, you have to analyze your situation. In some projects, you may need to collect baseline data, um, and either it may be available or you need to collect it. And then as part of analysis, you may also want to do a root cause analysis, and that's really trying to understand the root cause analysis. There's a tendency when we're, people are doing quality improvement projects is we want to jump to a change idea because we believe that we intuitively know what is going to work and what isn't. And there are various projects, and I'm certainly guilty of that, where you put in a lot of time and effort into developing a change idea without fully understanding that it is not going to address the root cause problem. And therefore, it is not going to lead to an important change or at least a sustainable change. So one of the tools you can use is the Fishbowl and Ishikawa diagram, and I'll show an example of that, or five whys. And five whys is really sort of, you know, the toddler asking why, why, why after every question. So why do we have increased, theoretically increased the uh, number of catheter-associated UTIs on one of the medicine wards? Uh, well, because we have nursing shortages. Well, why do we have nursing shortages? Uh, we have nursing shortages because of COVID pandemic and so on and so forth and helps you sort of get into uh, the additional root causes. You can also use something called run charts and that's really to either analyze your baseline process or to study whether there's been an impact after your change and I'll show an example of that as, for later as well. So this is an example of a fishbone or a Chicago diagram and um, the problem that you're looking at is long test results time. And you essentially work backwards to think about all the various system components that may be contributing to this. So what are some of the issues within an equipment? And within that, you identify some of the processes and then break down further causes. So one of the equipment issues, maybe lab equipment is slow or just doesn't have the capacity to process as many tests. We certainly saw that during our uh, COVID uh, waves in terms of processing NPS results. It may be an issue around environment. It may be an issue in terms of processes and methods, or it may be related to you know, providers. Perhaps part of the reason why there's a long result is in our old paper system, physician orders were illegible and nurses had to call and clarify the orders with the unit clerks were not familiar with how to order certain things in the system. This kind of helps you understand and think about all the various causes that may be contributing. And then you can sort of think about, okay, which of these causes do we want to tackle? Or which of these causes do we think is contributing the most? So let's say you have thought about your problem. You have tried to understand the root cause analysis and you have generated a long list of things that may be potentially contributing. How do you decide what changes to implement? So you can sometimes think of broader categories of change. What sort of change are you trying to implement? Are you trying to eliminate waste? Are you trying to improve a workflow? Is the change to improve service? Is the change to try and create a change in the work environment? Or is your change could be about 
reducing errors. One of the tools that I really like is when you have multiple ideas in terms of change is how do you decide what is going to work? And there's a bit of, you know, educational sort of, you know, best educational guests involved in this. And one of the things you can use is the pick chart. So on this side, we have how easy or feasible is it to implement this change versus how challenging will it be to implement or how costly? And will you have a low payoff with this change idea or a high payoff? And then you can sort of think about where your change ideas fit in. And ideally, you want to be in the implement green box, something that's easy and feasible to implement, but it is going to have a high payoff. So for some projects that are multidisciplinary involving our team, often what we'll do is we'll just put all of our change ideas in sticky notes and then just put them on a whiteboard and create a picture and then try to focus on the ideas that we think fall within this box. I'll just quickly talk a bit about measures, um, because if you are doing a QPI project, you will notice some of these measures being brought up. So there's three main measures that you think about within QI methodology, your outcome measures, and I think that everyone's familiar with, what are we trying to get to? So your outcome is the number of catheter-associated UTIs on medicine ward, let's say E3. Your process measure is, are we doing the right things to get there? So let's say, one of the change ideas we came up with to reduce catheter associated UTIs is to put up a physical sign very similar to the falls risk above the patient to say, if patient has a catheter, please reassess. The process measure will be how often is that sign actually being put up above the patient's bedside? Because if that's not happening, if the processes that need to happen in order for that change to be implemented are not happening, then obviously we're not going to have the same impact on our outcome measures. And then your balancing measures are while you're trying to improve one thing, are we causing problems in another part of the system? So it's all very well that we have created these signs, but is that now leading to additional workload for the nurses where they have to go find the sign? The human clerk has to print additional signs. Someone has to remember to put it up. And is that causing additional strain for nurses' workload? So let's say you have implemented your change ideas and you've been measuring. How do you decide that you have demonstrated an impact? So there are certain quality improvement projects where you may be able to gather large level data or you know, large number of data points, and you can have a pre versus post intervention comparison. But often with projects that are smaller and you're trying to implement a change and do iterative cycles, you need to be able to see on a regular basis quickly to see if you're making an impact so you can make decisions about making changes. So you can use run charts and essentially run charts are to determine that all the variation that happens in whatever value you're measuring, is this variation random or is there a trend suggesting that something else has caused it? So there are different sort of rules within run charts. So an example could be five consecutive points that are increasing or decreasing, six consecutive points on one side of the median, and then there's a few additional uh, run chart rules that you can also look at. And this is not just used to demonstrate impact. It could actually be used to study something going wrong. So for instance, our hospitals do regularly measure number of hospital acquired C. difficile infection or central line infections or catheter associated UTIs. So let's say we are measuring and there's random variation in catheter associated UTIs, but then we start to notice that on one of the wards, there's five consecutive increasing points in catheter associated UTIs makes us pause and think that this may not be a random variation. And is there something different going on on that ward that's leading to this? If one of the wards is getting increasingly more C. difficile infection, do we need to think about a change in our environmental clinic processes or has there been another change? It sort of essentially raises a red flag for you to say, this is not just random variation, something else is going on that needs to be looked at. So I'll switch gears a little bit about and talk about quality improvement education and curriculum, um, because I think ultimately our residents and our learners are going to inherit some of the challenges of our healthcare system, and they will be key in shaping our future uh, quality improvement and safety organization cultures, as well as helping tackle some of the challenges and innovations that are needed in our system. 
So I'll share a bit about some of the frameworks I have used for the General Internal Medicine Fellowship Program. And I adapted some of this framework from other colleagues from Toronto that do quality improvement education, such as Brian Wong. And the framework I created and adapted for our local GIM program is sort of based on three components. So one is the formal curriculum. So residents will do uh, IHI or Institute of Healthcare Improvement open school modules. And these are online modules that go over some of the basics of quality improvement, such as quality measures, some of the tools that we've talked about for root cause analysis, along with examples that are given. So these modules are really good for just learning the basic lingo and the basics of quality improvement. We also do didactic sessions on introduction to quality improvement and patient safety to solidify some of that learning and the foundational knowledge. The second component is ed educational activities that are spread throughout the two-year curriculum. And we do quality improvement and patient safety workshops with you know, sort of theoretical scenarios and they work on developing aim statements, what their measures would be, how they would engage stakeholders. And it allows them to work through a project in a simulated setting rather than jumping into a project right away. And then we also do simulations. Uh, in fact, we did a simulation yesterday uh, with the mannequin and uh, very similar to what we would do for a mock code blue. And we did a simulation with an escape room on patient uh, latent safety threats. And uh, I find that both the residents as well as myself really enjoy that. Um, and then the third component is working on improvement initiatives. And that's really working on a quality improvement project as a team throughout their two years. And then they usually present their project both at the end of their PGY four year, at the end of PGY five year, uh, at our annual quality improvement research uh, day. So in terms of educational activities, the goal really is for them to develop skills related to safety or quality improvement and core clinical competencies. So during our workshops, we'll often highlight some of the important scenarios such as patient handover, disclosure of medication errors or other medical errors, and then safe medication practices or discharge practices. The QI workshops also help them apply some of the following tools, such as the flow chart or the current process mapping, um, thinking about the various wastes in healthcare, thinking about root cause analysis, and they do uh, use tools such as five wise Roshikova diagrams, as well as working through PDSA cycles. Residents also do one journal club. Um, her, uh, throughout the year that will be on a quality improvement study. And it helps them not only understand quality improvement studies, but also develop uh, sort of competencies in how to do critical appraisal of these studies. So just sort of an overview of how the residents move through uh, the curriculum throughout their two years. So the first stage is really about sort of that development of their project. So they'll brainstorm different ideas, and we sort of help them and guide them what is a feasible project. And sometimes we will use the pick chart to narrow down either their project or their change idea. They learn how to apply the model for improvement. And then uh, the residents create project charters as a team, define their study variables and what their QI metrics will be. And then middle of sort of the year, just around the winter holidays or just before the winter holidays, I should say, uh, they do a five minute elevator pitch presentation that they would do to get buy-in from stakeholders. Then they design and implement their process improvement, implement their PDSA cycles, and then do the data analysis. And the goal is usually that by the end of their PGY four years, they've at least gone through one PDSA cycle with the goal of uh, being that during PGY five year, they will further improve their projects and then develop uh, sustainability. And then they present at the annual QI research day. We also encourage them to present at the um, Department of Medicine Research Day. And our recent graduating PGY-5 group uh, did present at Department of Medicine uh, Research Day, and they presented on the Loxone in Hand, a quality improvement uh, project to increase the uh, use of take home the Loxone kits to patients with opioid use disorder. Um, and they actually won for their poster this year in the subspecialty category. So what works, so what is important in terms of quality improvement curriculum? And I really like the systematic review that sort of highlights what works for whom and in one context. And I wanted to share some of my personal experience in terms of quality improvement curriculum um, uh, based on our GIM curriculum. So this systematic review sort of highlights and consolidates a framework 
about uh, important factors that need to be taken into account to make sure that the curriculum is successful. So the first is really your organizational context and thinking about, do we have a pre-existing QI culture? Is there a medical school buy-in? Is there a healthcare system support and buy-in? And is there alignment between curriculum and health system priorities? And I wanted to highlight this because I certainly noticed that this was a very important factor um, with our GIM curriculum. Often residents would come up with projects that are fantastic projects, but if those projects are not aligned with the priorities of the health system, when they would go to try to implement those projects, they did have more challenges in terms of getting buy-in. So I think it's important to understand where our academic as well as our uh, health system priorities align. In terms of the teaching context, the curriculum strategies, there's different strategies that have been implemented at various academic uh, centers. Uh, it could be a didactic curriculum, it could be a clerkship curriculum, it could be electives, it could be just focused on the chief residents or monthly conferences. I personally prefer the longitudinal hybrid curriculum where there is a bit of didactic sessions, but then they're also working on the project and it's longitudinal. So it's not just about you know, attending an elective and during that time they're focused on quality improvement, but something that goes throughout their two years so they can continuously apply the methodology and not just sort of learn about quality improvement in an abstract manner. Um, in terms of mechanisms, I 100% agree with all of those and would emphasize those that you need to have a structure for your curriculum. There needs to be protected time. So we do have dedicated assigned quality improvement academic half days. It is not something that we simply do on the site outside their usual academic half days. Mentorship and feedback is very important. And then there needs to be leadership for the curriculum because the curriculum itself also needs to adapt over time and adjust based on the needs of the residents. In terms of the project mechanisms, um, I definitely agree with project topic screening. Residents in my experience often don't have the same level of understanding of organizational culture and structure. And often the projects that they may think are easy to implement may not be. So it is important to support them. The GIM fellows all work in a team. And I think that has a few benefits. A, no one is working individually on a project. It allows them to have accountability to each other. It mimics what a real quality improvement project in future clinical practice or in a hospital setting may look like. Um, and then they do have regular meetings on top of their protected half days. And then we provide the mentorship. And, you know, sort of coming out all of this, I do feel that from an academic point of view, their level of competency and comfort with quality improvement curriculum significantly improves and their projects have also had, you know, impact on our healthcare systems. So resident education is important, but what about faculty education and resources or for those of us that want to get started on quality improvement and learn more about it, either for CPD purposes or if you wanted to you know, lead or be part of a curriculum yourself. So our second annual Quality Improvement Patient Symposium is coming up on October 20th. This is a virtual event and I would encourage everyone to register. Um, the theme this year is looking to the future of reimagining quality improvement. We have great keynote speakers. So Dr. Brian Wong from Toronto, who's an expert in quality improvement, as many would know. And he's presenting on how should quality improvement chase, change post pandemic as well as our second keynote is from Ontario Health. Susan will be presenting on building a better healthcare system post pandemic. We also have a few breakout sessions where you, know, you can learn a little bit about some of the fundamentals that we talked about, such as the PDSA cycle or data for improvement, building a virtual hospital, patient-driven quality improvement, patient safety, and a bit around change management and leadership. We also will have poster presentation I'm sorry, oral presentation from three poster winners, as well as an opportunity for networking. And this will be virtual. If you are not able to attend the symposium or wanted to get more resources on learning about quality improvement, there are certainly lots of resources available for faculty education. Some of the things that I can share is, so the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, the IHI, has an open school with different modules that you can sign up for. And at least for residents that are free, and I'm pretty sure they should be free for faculty as well. And they have a lot of additional resources that you can also use. There's also the ideas course, improving and driving excellence across sectors. 
McMaster also now has a local foundational certificate course, the Matt Kipps course, and this is the second year of the course is happening. And again, it's virtual CPD course, usually after hours, so very easy for faculty to incorporate and attend that. And there's different uh, components of the course along with working on a project and getting mentorship on that. University of Toronto also has a course through their Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety that you can also attend. If you were not looking for a sort of a formal course to attend, but are looking for more resources, you can also go to the uh, CPSO website that has the QI program resources or the Royal College of uh, Surgeon and uh, Physician Surgeons of Canada also has essential guidance for quality improvement with various components. And some of the examples that I talked about for section three credits are also there along with uh, tools and sort of worksheets that you can look through. And that's it. So I'll stop sharing there and see if anyone has questions or comments. Thank you, uh, uh, Amna, for this overview that has covered so much in 42 minutes. So thank you very much. You know, I covered uh, lots of basics in quality improvement as well as uh, your great work in uh, education. Um, if you have any question, please put it in the Q&A, and if you'd like to have a comment or ask your question in person, uh, please raise your hand, and I see uh, Dr. Dorsami has his hand up, uh, Panji, I think you're allowed to speak right now, unmute, and you can go ahead. Thank you, Khalid, and uh, thank you, Amna, for that very erudite presentation. Um, I just like to uh, ask a question about using quality improvement, the philosophies of quality improvement in, uh, in, in trying to bring out some institutional change. Now, I want to give you one example, and I'm speaking from a respirology point of view. Over the past few years, we've noticed that with some changes in staffing and etc., it's become extremely difficult for us to book bronchoscopies for patients. Now we know where the problems, at least I know some of it, where the problems arise. And I'm sure if my, some of my respiratory colleagues are listening, they, they may share some of these things that I'm going to mention. So we know that there are institutional changes uh, in the structure of you know, the people that are involved in bronchoscopy. And I can assure you that it's becoming extremely more difficult to get a patient booked for a bronchoscopy timelessly. As a result, it leads to delays in diagnosis with the consequence of you know, uh, not, not sort of treating patients uh, efficiently and effectively. And at the same time, leading to longer hospitalizations for these patients. Now I'm talking particularly about inpatient bronchoscopy. Outpatient bronchoscopy is a little different because they're not, they're not urgent, but they're still important to do them. Yeah. So I wonder if you can give us some idea without having to sort of go through a quality improvement uh, sort of study as it were, how using the philosophies uh, and the basis of quality improvement to improve our uh, access to bronchoscopy. And like, like I said, this is just one example in respirology. Yeah, so, and, and this is a great point. And, you know, one of the challenges with our sort of everywhere within our healthcare system is that resources are very stretched right now. Unfortunately, quality improvement methodology itself cannot change or alter the resources that you have. But one of the tools that can be applied is sort of thinking about organizational culture. So I think part of the challenge that our healthcare system is facing at a broader level is that we're not necessarily having conversations at an organizational level with transparency about some of the challenges that we're facing. And in order to have a just and safe organizational culture, we actually have to have transparent measures of where things are at. We have to have patient and family engagement. And I think there has to be sort of a balance between psychological safety in terms of sharing some of these issues that our healthcare is facing and a learning system to sort of say, okay, these are some of the ideas and how do we implement them? So I think 
quality improvement methodology itself cannot alter or change the resources, but the methodology can be used to sort of reflect a bit more on an open and more transparent culture that looks at some of these metrics. So, you know, it's not just about sort of philosophically saying that we're reaching barriers in terms of looking at bronchoscopy, but using that methodology to actually measure and share some of those challenges and those numbers and those delays. And that's shared transparently with everyone with psychological safety of everyone being able to feel comfortable and openly discuss with leadership some of the challenges. But I don't think the methodology itself can address the resources. The other thing that can be used, and it has been used elsewhere where resources are sometimes very stretched, is to do process mapping and think about where else can some of the other waste in healthcare or components that are not adding value could be eliminated, and sort of the lean methodology. It likely will not take away all of our staff shortages, challenges that we're facing everywhere, but that's one strategy that can also be sort of looked at and applied in certain areas. Thank you, Amna. I think that's very useful, and I'll take you on your expertise one day and meet with you to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Panji. Uh, if you have any other, uh, anyone else has any question or want to uh, come up with a comment, please uh, uh, raise your hand or put it in the Q and A. I'm, I have I have a tough I mean a question that I struggle I struggle with at times you know and maybe it is in a way you know uh, stems out from what uh, Panji was talking about you know I mean we all want to do quality improvement in our day to day practice so do you have an advice on when do a, a physician or a, a provider can work on a quality improvement project by themselves pulling up tools from all the resources that you've given us. Uh, versus when do they come to someone like you or others who are experts in the field to, for some advice and uh, guidance? And last is when do you really go to the hospital or the uh, healthcare system that you're in and say, you know what, there is a problem here. Let's all of us work uh, uh, on it on it together. And, and thinking in that context, what you've touched on is, you know, aligning the physician priorities with the health system priorities, you know, because that is essential for the success of a quality improvement project. I know it's a big question. Yeah, no, no, I understand. So I think from an individual point of view, there are certainly a lot of projects that you can tackle on your own without necessarily having someone involved. And it could be something as simple as your own clinical workflow. So an example for me, like I shared was, I found Epic changed a lot of our workflows. And one of my biggest worries with Epic was that, am I going to miss patient results? Am I going to miss you know, that person's biopsy because now I'm relying on a completely different system? Um, so that's something where you may not necessarily need to go to someone else and you could do your own reflection and develop your own ideas. And it may involve other colleagues in the sense that they may not be part of your project, but you can reach out to others and say, hey, what tips work well for you versus others? And this may not necessarily be quality improvement in terms of patients, but I found even the changes within the billing system. And I did a bit of trial and error with the billing with the Epic News system, and I found it didn't work well for me. Um, so I sort of thought about it. I compared my old system, I compared my new system, and then I essentially sort of created a hybrid of the to where I'm using my older system of still writing out the billing codes, but I can now at least have the patient stickers printed. And you know, that may not sort of seem like quality improvement where you know, if you've driven important patient outcomes, but the reality is that our daily clinical workflows that we essentially repeat on a daily basis for years on are just as important as some of the other projects that we work on. So I think for those that are looking to just start a project, one thing could be just thinking about your clinical workflows and what processes don't work well for you. What are some of the inefficiencies that you could be looking at? Um, hopefully at some point, we're gonna start talking a little bit more with everyone about how to use Epic to generate your own data reports. And it could be about, you know, what are the diagnoses that are getting admitted under you? What are the readmission rates? Um, one of the other things you can look at is, and you know, <coughs> sort of a slice or dicer within an Epic is, you can look at your own sort of pajama time, right? How many hours are you spending outside of working hours looking up results on Epic and doing your notes? So I can certainly tell you when I, Epic came, I found I was doing a lot of notes after hours. So 
this could be sort of your process or improvement project is how do I change my workflow to minimize those after hours? I think projects that may be sort of within just your division is sort of probably the next step or within your unit. Um, so, you know, one example is the, for instance, the Gemini reports that are going to be coming for the general internal medicine physicians. And that certainly can be done individually, but I do suspect that there will be a lot of value in terms of us discussing that as a division rather than just thinking about how to make changes individually. And then I think anything that's going to involve pretty much patients, whether that's ambulatory or inpatient, in my experience, it is near impossible to make any process changes without getting stakeholder buy-in from the hospital point of view. Um, and I think we are making progress in terms of those relationships and you know, engagement on both sides in terms of projects that are being driven by the hospitals where physicians are joining or projects that are being driven by physicians and hospital is supporting that. And I think we're making progress there. It can be challenging, and that is one of the challenges that the GIM fellows learn is how do you reach out to administration? How do you reach out to leaders? And how do you sort of get by when everyone is busy? And how do you make sure that you address their priorities and they understand your priorities? And if anyone at any point is interested in doing a project, but need a little bit of extra help or need someone to sort of connect them with uh, hospital leadership or administrations, I'm sure you, know, you can reach out to college as well, but absolutely don't hesitate to reach out to me as well and we can sort of provide you with some guidance. But, but I do think that in my experience, we have gained more momentum um, over the last several years in terms of getting better at that. COVID has led to a lot of challenges, but I think we also have to think about the amount of um, innovation and quality improvement and the processes that happen and the collaboration that happened between physicians as well as other stakeholders in terms of all the changes that we implemented. And we implemented them pretty fast. So I think that despite the challenges, it gives me a very optimistic um, sort of outlook that, you know, there is, there is room for further engagement and collaboration, despite our challenges. That's, that's, that's great, actually, I, I, I like that summary so much. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions uh, or comments. Uh, so it looks like uh, uh, we're gonna give people five minutes of their day back for them to reflect and think about what they could improve in their uh, uh, practice and whether it's gonna be at the individual level, at the group level or at the system level. Uh, and uh, maybe reach out uh, uh, to you, to myself, to others who are able to uh, help them and uh, get this because it's much more moving. You know, I mean, there's a lot of quality improvement that has happened, but there's a lot more that uh, could be done as well. And uh, Serena says it's a great talk. So thank you very much, uh, Amna. Greatly appreciated the great talk. And I wish everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great seeing everyone. Take care.